Uh, welcome back. Thank you for returning promptly. Welcome to the final session of the Social Outcomes Conference on the second deep dive on learning to let go. How can central government rebuild, question mark, local government capacity to support the levelling up agenda? My name is Kieran Martin. I'm a professor of practice here at the school. I'm a former uh, senior civil servant in the UK government in Whitehall, so I spent uh, many years learning not to let go. And so this is a very uh, timely uh, discussion. Um, I know you've been here all day, so you may not have been following some of the uh, announcements, but with the new Prime Minister's announcement on energy, for example, has unleashed further debate on central versus local power with uh, the uh, easing of the restrictions on fracking and the debate on where local objections may be uh, overridden. We are talking about the UK, uh, has a reputation, which some will say is deserved, some will not say, uh, deserved as a highly centralised country. When we talk about the UK, we will also need to be clear what we are talking about by international comparators. All parts of the UK might come across as relatively centralised, but one of the features, for example, of today's fracking debate is the difference uh, in local autonomy uh, within England, where 85% of the population live, and elsewhere in the UK, where it appears, for example, that the Prime Minister's announcement may not extend to Scotland and uh, possibly Wales and Northern Ireland um, as, as well. So we have um, a great set of uh, presenters. Uh, we have five different short presentations featuring eight experts uh, in all. And without further uh, ado, I will uh, invite I will invite them uh, sort of uh, one by one rather than introduce all the presenters at once and then introduce them again. Uh, we will, uh, we're going until uh, half past uh, five. We're aiming for the last sort of half hour or a little bit more of that to be interactive, to have questions from you and for those of you kind enough to join us uh, online. So without further ado, I thought the best way of getting this uh, started would be a presentation from uh, two of the leaders of the um, Government Outcomes Lab, from Michael Gibson and Felix anselm Lanier, on uh, joining up services to level up social outcomes. Michael. Thanks, Kieran. Um, so I think, as you mentioned, this is a really timely discussion. Uh, particularly with the new prime minister, there's a lot of question marks over what leveling up will be like now. Um, I think that's a bit of uncertainty, but perhaps there's something we can learn from what's already happened, what's been tried before, what's happening right now. And I think that's, this, that's what this session is really looking to do. Um, so the presentation I'm going to give is by myself, Felix, and Dr. Albert Carter, who's the research director of the GoLab. Um, We've been looking at efforts to join up public services in England to level up social outcomes. Um, so if you have the next slide. So I think kind of some motivation for this paper that we've been working on is this idea of fragmentation of public services. Um, if you're like a vulnerable service user, you might experience um, various different services. You know, if you have health issues, you might also be suffering from economic disadvantage, you're dealing with a lot of services. This is particularly a problem in the context of leveling up, right? Where people in left behind places might be more likely to experience these disadvantages. They're also likely to feel the impact of kind of more fragmented institutions as there's less local government capacity in these places. But there's been a lot of efforts over the last 25 years to try and address some of this, to better coordinate public services. Um, so Felix L and I have been looking over the last year or so at kind of what's happened in these central government efforts to join up local public services. And what can it tell us about the relationship between centre and local in England? Um, so to do this, we've, had, we've looked at 55 different initiatives over the last 25 years that are centrally led um, intended to join up public services at some kind of subnational level, be it from the neighbourhood to regions. We've looked at two different policy documents, kind of policy announcements, white papers, things like that, to try and really understand what was the aim of this programme, what were they trying to achieve, how were they trying to achieve it, and what can they tell us about what we should do next. Um, and so we've kind of recorded these initiatives on kind of three different key criteria. Uh, in the next so 
the first we looked at was the central lever. So like, what is central government pulling to initiate joining up at a local level? We classified three different levers, um, law and regulation. So that's acts of parliament, regulatory frameworks, things like that. Funding and fiscal powers, which includes direct funding programs, but also things that um, try to bring together funding at a local level, budget pooling. Um, and administration, which is kind of our catch-all bucket of everything else, um, things like nudge efforts, governance arrangements, that sort of thing. I think the main thing we noted here is funding has been the kind of dominant approach over the last 25 years by far, um, kind of consistently across administrations. The second thing we looked at in the next slide is the allocation process. So how are areas selected to receive the support? Um, in the blue, you have universal programs that applied across the whole of the country, but there's also a lot of targeting, um, and this can be done in various ways. So the largest, the most common way is competitive funding. Um, this is where areas have to, are given a set of criteria, they respond and they're scored against them. And those who score highest would kind of win. Um, but there are other ways of doing it. Uh, Needs-based allocation looks at, is a central look, at which area needs support the most based on something like the indices or deprivation. Um, and then finally, we kind of have this negotiated, um, negotiated allocation process where it's optional. It's an optional program, but it's kind of tailored to specific areas, something like devolution deals where there's kind of a negotiation process as to how, as to what it'll look like. Um, I guess the thing to note over time here is this be a shift from 2010 towards more competitive funding. Uh, and things continue right through every day. And then finally, the focus of this session, on the next slide, is the governance model. So we wanted to look at how is the program governed? Is it centralized? Is it localized? Um, to do this, we operationalized a framework from Jerry Stoker and kind of did this along two dimensions. So where does objective setting and political accountability sit? And where does the approach to achieving those kind of those objectives sit? Um, so you have kind of the classic top-down program where they're centrally defined objectives, the accountability runs back to the center, and the, the approach to achieving objectives is prescribed in that central program. At the other end of the spectrum, you have community leadership where local um, actors set the objectives, the accountability is held locally and the approach to achieving it can be locally defined. And in the middle, the most common thing we saw was this constrained discretion model where objective setting and accountability still sits with the center, but there's some flexibility around how you might achieve those objectives. And on the next slide, we see that this was kind of pretty con consistent over time, far a small kind of gap in 2010 to 2012, where you did see some of this community leadership um, Maybe it's tied to this idea of the open public services gender, where the second principle held and how it should be decentralized to the most appropriate level. But I guess what we do see is that this hasn't lasted, this didn't stay. Um, we kind of went back to the constraint discretion model. I guess to bring a bit of color to these different kind of models, we've got some examples from our um, research on the next slide. Uh, I think we'll get into more detail of these different models in the following presentations that might give a bit more flavor, but just kind of as a few examples, things like joint targeted area, area inspections give a very top-down um, regulatory approach where Ofsted come together with uh, the fire inspectorate, prisons inspectorate to kind of conduct joint inspections um, in a way that's very centrally defined. You have something more in the middle like troubled families where there is kind of clear central accountability, but a bit of flexibility around how that's delivered. And finally, you have things that do fit this community leadership model, things like community budgets, where funding was tried, was attempted to be pulled at the local level. I think on the next slide, we also want to make the point that these aren't fixed, really sharply defined categories. Things are a bit messier. Um, and some programs don't really neatly fit into these boxes. I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Sometimes it's more of a spectrum than really sharply defined boxes. Um, and also there's a challenge with the unit of analysis. Are we thinking about the full program or are we thinking about individual projects within it? 
Um, so for example, the Life Chances Fund, something we know very well at the Go Lab, we have quite um, strong local ownership of projects. But the overall program is accountable to central government and the overarching fund of objectives are centrally defined by DCMS. Um, I think with the final slide, before we move on to kind of seeing more local examples, we already want to say like, what's the point of all this? Um, we've kind of told you about some governance models. We're going to talk about these governance models. We can't really say whether one of these models of joining up works better than the others. Um, I don't, in our um, research, we've only looked at uh, the sort of ex ante project um, policy documents. We hope in future to kind of focus more on linking this to outcomes and what did they actually achieve. But I think it still has relevance to kind of think about how you design an initiative will have a big role to play in what governments model you get. Um, and if we want to achieve this policy objective that I did learn with the agenda of greater devolution and local control, government really needs to be really thoughtful about how it builds in local governments into that. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Michael, a really great start for me. My apologies for omitting Dr. Ellie Carter from the um, uh, contributors uh, from that. But I think some really striking um, analysis in that presentation. In 55 policy initiatives in this area in 25 years is rather a lot by anyone's standards. So congratulations for bringing out some discernible themes about the dominance of money around the move towards competitive models of funding. And if you like the dalliance with um, full concepts and application of subsidiarity and then if, if you like effectively walking that back and uh, towards a model of constrained discretion which I think we'll hear more about uh, later uh, later on um, but we are looking primarily at the country we're in but we want to uh, look uh, internationally at um, best um, practice and what other uh, experiences can tell us both in terms of actually the case for uh, local devolution perhaps later uh, some of the limitations of that. So um, uh, we have, um, uh, again, uh, from within the school, we have uh, Ian Taylor here in person and um, Suzanne Frick online uh, to uh, take us to, to the next set of discussions. Okay, so I'll come to that point. Okay, well, so, um, yeah, Suzanne and I are going to uh, do a presentation on a project we've been working on recently, which is called the, we call it the International Comparisons Project, where we're looking at um, resilient cities that have been able to withstand uh, quite challenging post-industrial uh, challenges and they've stood prospered. Uh, so next slide, please. So the, just a very briefly, the project context of this, um, the project that we're working on is funded by the Lincoln Land Institute in America. They're interested in uh, looking at the different uh, international examples, but also by the University of Oxford Martin School. Uh, our project is part of a wider project called the Home Winds Project based uh, here at the Blavatnik School, which is also uh, a joint project between the University of Sheffield and the UK 2070 Commission, which was set up by the, um, by the former um, head of the civil service. So the aim of the project is to inform UK levelling up debates with insights from a range of uh, countries and city regions. So next slide, please. So uh, the objective of, of our project was to focus on the role the interplay between land markets, planning, finance, and government governance can play in helping cities to turn around. Uh, and we wanted to identify lessons learned, best practice, in order to provide actionable guidance for local authorities in the UK and elsewhere. And so we selected some suitable cities internationally as examples that we could study. So we engaged in in-depth case studies of those cities, and that was a multi-method approach where we did a, we analyzed data, looked at documents. Uh, literature and also conducted elite interviews with their people on the ground in, in those countries. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the selection, we got eight uh, cities that we looked at in different countries. So we have uh, Windsor in Ontario and Canada. We have Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, USA. We've got three in Germany, uh, Duisburg, Dortmund and Leipzig. Uh, Lille in France, Bau in Spain, and then Newcastle, New South Wales in Australia. We selected these uh, because they were resilient cities, but they, they had a commonality uh, of conditions that were quite similar to the cases in the UK that need to be looked at in leveling up. 
Um, and uh, the, but they also have some variance in their experience as well, so it's a bit of variety. So next slide, please. So yes, yeah, so we studied different aspects. Uh, we researched their uh, land markets and the role of regenerating uh, derelict industrial land. So for instance, we looked at the, the log port concept in Duisburg and uh, the emergence of a logistics cluster there. The instrument of tax increment financing in Pittsburgh was really interesting, the way that they've got the ability to, uh, to use that instrument. So we looked at the, the role of local decentralized finance, which is quite important as a condition in different countries. So for instance, uh, the USA has community banking, which is uh, it plays an interesting role and Germany has a spark ass and this all plays into this economic development that we were studying. Uh, we, but really important was the role of non-state actors uh, in, the, in the local economic development, uh, especially at the local level. So we found things like the, uh, the strong community leadership in Pittsburgh is really interesting, foundations on the ground. They also have uh, community development corporations and uh, business uh, leadership bodies. And then the same in, uh, in Germany, there was the, the importance of the Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So next slide, please. So really what were we looking at was fundamentally, we're trying to understand what happens in these cities when they take a place like this. So this was the, uh, the Hazelwood Green development uh, in Pittsburgh. It's an old uh, steel work and, and you can see there, it's, uh, it's the, just the shell stopped working a long time ago and it's just a brownfield site. But how do these cities take these kind of redundant uh, Fordist era um, assets and then turn them into something useful in the fourth industrial revolution. So next slide, please. So this is what it looks like now. Uh, it's called Mill 19. Um, so it's in that larger Hazelwood Green uh, site, but you can see they've, they've greened it, they've got solar panels at the back there. It's very environmentally friendly. It's very nice to be in, lots of transportation connectivity. And it's actually now a high-tech laboratories where they do things like robotics, Uber were an early tenant to this place and uh, the uh, Carnegie Mellon University used those laboratories as well. So it's a really great asset and it's, it's things like that that are replicated in all these different examples that we studied. We wanted to know how they were doing that and what was happening in all these cases really was there were lots of different actors involved. So for this one, the federal government were involved, the state government were involved, the city authorities, foundations actually bought the site in the first place and drove its development. Uh, university was involved, there was the impact investors as well from Boston. So it's Really interesting, diverse number of actors. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so the relevance to this session, of course, is just what we discovered. Uh, it was not necessarily what we were looking for, but it was what we discovered that in each of these instances, there was a uh, collaboration and interaction, positive interaction between the different levels of governance. And in all of the examples that we looked at, there was a very strong MISO level, intermediate level governance at the regional level. So the city was very strong. The regional level was very strong. And then the country, national, federal level, whatever it was at the different uh, countries, was engaging positively and empowering those lower levels of governance to, to use their assets. So now I'm going to pass over to Suzanne, and she's going to talk you through a couple of the insights just briefly that we found. Um, and uh, I think in the chat that we posted an insights paper, if, if you're interested, you can have a look at some of the other insights we found. So over to you, Suzanne. Where you'll... Great. Uh, thank you so much, Ian. So I have a slight technical glitch. Can you actually hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you, Suzanne. Okay, so I'm, I can actually not see the right slides. Um, so I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to look at the slides that I have on my laptop. Hopefully it works this way. Can you please go on slide number 20, starting the role of local or regional government? That's what we have, yeah. Um, so, perfect, great. All right, so let's take it from here. So as Ian mentioned before, one of the things that we started discovering once we looked at the case studies was that there was a very strong role of the local and the regional governments in driving this local change um, across all the different countries and cases we looked at, independent of the sort of political system um, or administrative systems that we found in the different countries. So the first insight that we want to highlight that we found across the case studies is that successful turnaround cities and regions were created through bottom up, uh, were created bottom up through strong local and or regional leadership rather than central government led policies. Um, and that was really quite striking um, that we saw this across the, the, the cases. And some of the reasons for that that we found is it's on the one side, if you have local leaders actually taking the leadership or regional leaders taking the leadership for local regeneration, they have simply a much greater local knowledge about the situation locally. So they know about the challenges, they know about the opportunities, and they know 
often much better what needs to be done and where the opportunities are. So they can turn these into more tailor-made strategies. Um, the second reason that we found um, in these cases was that actually there seems to be a higher motivation to drive local change. And I think intuitively that makes sense. If you live in a place, you're obviously keen for a place to change for the better, for, for your own sake, for your family's sake, um, for your friend's sake and for your community's sake. You might have the same motivation if you sit in central government, but um, intrinsically, I guess you're more motivated to do it if you actually live locally. Um, Next slide, please. So slide 21, um, just to give you a few examples from the specific case studies. So if we look at Canada, specifically the city of Windsor, we had actually the Ontario state government that typically is in charge of state aid, so state aid for industries, but they devolved it down to the city level. And in this case, we had the city of Windsor and that they had a strong idea and a strong out, um, vision for the automotive section. And they really managed to, to turn this around quite successfully. Um, and the sector is growing strongly now. If you look um, at our case study in Australia, Newcastle and New South Wales, actually there um, you didn't have so much the city government taking the lead, but it was a regional government that created a detailed uh, strategy and also secured the funding for the downtown district. Um, but again, the, the regional government and not the central government and the regional government did this in collaboration with the city. And then Germany is a, is a very particular case because you actually have within the constitution an objective which states that um, the state needs to achieve equitable living conditions across the whole country. And this is really refracted across a lot of the different policy fields. And it is also reflected in the federal organization of the country. So in the case of Germany, it's actually regional governments that are responsible for the promotion um, of their economies and also for the structurally weaker regions in collaboration with cities, whereas the central government um, holds mainly a coordinative function or a funding function actually as well. But I know Benjamin is going to talk about this in more detail later. Next slide, please. Um, so we know that local responsibility um, and local power matters for local regeneration. But what we also saw in these cases is that these local power were always complemented by a significant and stable long-term funding base. So um, it was not that local governments had to reapply and reapply consistently for new small funding pots, but they actually had a long-term funding base. And that enabled them to actually create local capacities to develop and implement their visions um, rather than having to apply for small budget pots all the time. Um, again, a few examples. Um, we have the example we looked at the city of Bilbao in the Basque Country. It's a very particular example, but the, the, the region was actually one of the poorest regions in the 1980s and today's most innovative areas in all of Europe. Um, and part of um, why they managed this turnaround is on the one side, they had the responsibilities um, and the possibilities to do that, but they also counted with fiscal autonomy. So they had their own long-term funding. And I think here is important to highlight that um, this funding was actually complemented by EU funding at the very beginning, overcoming like the lower funding levels they actually had when they were not doing so well economically. Um, the second example, again, Australia is a different one. They don't have such a strong equalization system as some of the other countries between the regions, but they have very strong incentives from the central government, um, which incentivizes local governments to actually raise their own funds here in this case. Um, and Ian can speak also more about it if someone is interested um, by actually asset recycling. And then they were contributing or essentially topping up the money that was created locally. And then finally, also in Germany, again, a very complex system of equalization payments between regions, which helps to equalize the public spending powers between the regions. And this example, I just wanted to give a, a, a sense of actually the level of the uh, spending and the funding that is going into the year. In 2020, we had almost 15 billion euro um, being redistributed between the different regions and the 9 billion of supplementary grants from the central state. So we're talking about almost 25 billion that are being redistributed here only in a single year. 
Um, and then in 21, just a slightly different year number, so the federal funding system for structurally weaker regions, um, so it's a central a shared central regional government funding system. Actually, there were three billion going into structurally, um, structurally weaker regions. So it just gives us a sense of the amount of funding that actually goes into regional development topics um, compared to the UK leveling up fund, for example, which obviously is much lower in order. All right, so summing up, um, just a few key points to take away from this. So what we've seen in a lot of these cases, so independent of the specific political system that you found in the countries, there is in all of the cases a very strong emphasis on local leadership or regional leadership. Um, in some of the cases, we also had the responsibilities actually written down in the constitution, which is very different to the UK in the sense that these can obviously not be changed all the time. It's not something that is being negotiated over time, but it, that is pretty much set in stone and the different actors just, just go with it. Um, significant funding has gone into regional and local level um, development, um, which allows those areas to actually develop long-term visions. And then finally, um, we've really seen that where local governments were actually and local actors were actually giving the opportunity, all of them seem to step up um, and really raise to the occasion. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Suzanne and Ian. Before that, some really interesting examples from across the world bring out the importance of the politics, the policy and indeed the legal framework behind uh, issues of regeneration, the role of collaboration and visible leadership, and crucially, again, the role of money and who spends it. So a lot of research and analysis so far. Delighted now to turn to the next um, uh, speaker for a sense of more of that, but also um, how this works in an applied level on the ground. So very grateful to Michal Shinwell, a senior leader at Camden Council for making the journey uh, to be with us uh, today, who's going to talk to us about community leadership and locally led outcomes framework on uh, well-being. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Karen. Um, and, and thanks for the invitation to speak here today. Um, so what I'll be talking about is a project that we've undertaken in Camden uh, council to develop a local well-being outcomes measurement framework together with uh, partners and with the community. Um, I'll talk a little bit about just a, a short uh, brief intro into um, Camden. I was going to do a wink wink, but I think we'll do next slide, please. For, uh, <laughs> for, the, uh, Safer. for the presentation. Yeah. Uh, not, not I, I can leave you outside also. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so Camden is one of 32 London boroughs, um, and it is a very diverse, um, uh, a very diverse borough. It has 200, around 275,000 uh, people living in Camden, a very big student population. So the uh, people aged uh, 15 to 44 or, or 20 to 44 are the biggest uh, group in Camden. 32% um, of people live below the poverty line and there's a 5% um, unemployment rate, which is relatively low, but then uh, labor force participation is also low in Camden. It's the ninth highest uh, or most dense uh, borough or local authority in England and Wales. Uh, life satisfaction in Camden is low relative to London and the UK. And then, um, it's quite a diverse population in terms of uh, residents identifying as white British, which are uh, around 38%, 34% identify as black Asian or other, and 28% as non-British white. And over half of school students speak another uh, language, uh, a language other than English, and only 60% of Camden residents were born in uh, Britain or Ireland. So it's really quite an interesting um, inner city London uh, landscape. Um, we'll do next slide, please. So uh, the uh, project that I'm talking about, we're naming Good Life Camden uh, right now. It, we're, we're still thinking about the name, but uh, the aim of that is to develop and integrate a measurement framework which helps us measure current and future well-being of people in Camden. So we want to understand what's important for living a good life in Camden. We want to develop that together with the community and partners. So we're not doing this on our own in the council offices, but we're undertaking quite a broad engagement to co-create this with the community. Uh, we want to draw on uh, learning from people in Camden about what's important to them. We're also building on existing literature and best practices on uh, measuring well-being, both internationally, internationally, and 
and locally. Um, and we're also building on a hyperlocal project that we've had in uh, Camden, which is in the Houston area around the HS2 regeneration, um, which is called Good Life Houston, where uh, the Institute of Glo uh, for Global Prosper Prosperity in UCL um, has been leading on uh, together with the Houston Partnership and they've trained citizen scientists to go out into the field and to uh, explore and extract what's important for people uh, to live uh, in the Houston area. And there's going to be a, a household survey uh, to allow us to look at the actual data and to compare across areas. So what's uh, our approach in developing this framework? We're co-creating with the community and with partners. We want to test and refine, so we don't want to have a final uh, product, but rather to see how it's working with our um, policy making and decision making on the ground. We want to share early with partners. We're hoping to open source uh, data with community and partners, and in that we mean both to share uh, the data that we have publicly, but also to insource data from our partners and the community. So understanding that we don't hold all of the knowledge ourselves and, and, and inviting others to contribute. And we want to prioritize, prioritize indicators that reflect outcomes that are consistently measured over time, that are comparable to other places, that can be disaggregated to measure inequality. So we're a very uh, diverse uh, borough and we want to capture that. Um, and we want to include subjective measures and to really reflect the lived experience of people living in Camden. We move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so in Good Life Camden, in what we've been developing, we have a few objectives in terms of what we want this to be able to do. We want it to help us understand the things that are important to live a good life. We want it to help us keep track of how people are doing and who is being left behind. It, it will serve as a basis for conversation, both with partners and with the community about our strategic direction and goals in Camden. It helps us communicate on a common sense of uh, direction. It helps us engaging with citizens on participatory decision making. So as a context setting piece in saying this is what our current situation is as we understand it. And it helps us both internally and across um, organizations we work with in silo breaking. So it's a multidimensional approach, which looks at a broad, ra broad range of outcomes that are relevant for people's lives. And in that, it makes us take those things into consideration, even we're, when we're looking at a specific uh, policy, uh, policy intervention. Next slide, please. So what are we learning from, what are we wanting to learn from our community? And this is a project that is uh, in its early stages. We're uh, going to be having quite a few engagements over the autumn and, and the winter, and we'll be publishing this in, uh, or we'll be launching this in, in spring 2023. We want to ask people what's important for living a good life in Camden, what the dimensions, uh, which dimensions of, of uh, importance are uh, priorities and for whom, so to allow people to also say within the framework what's the most important thing for them. What should we call the framework? It sounds trivial, but it's very important for us to be able to communicate on this for people to find it accessible and understandable. Um, so, and, and also to reflect the, uh, the multicultural context of Camden. We have a lot of uh, different communities and we want to help uh, come up with a name that really reflects that. Um, and we want to ask them, how should the good life be measured? So to share, to, to choose, select the indicators, to really learn about the available data um, and what data is missing and how we can uh, fill those gaps together with our residents uh, and, and, and partners. Next slide, please. We're thinking about a few different uh, implementations of the framework. So we'll, uh, we don't have the framework yet. We will do uh, next year, but, we, but we're starting to think about, okay, we've got a framework, we have indicators. How do we actually make that make a difference in our decision-making? So we've got a few uh, things that we're starting to think about. One is about budget and finance. So using the framework to, to assess budget proposals or as an impact measurement tool for uh, uh, an imp impact measurement for financial tools. So in Camden, we've started to think about early thoughts about uh, a community wealth fund. Um, we've already issued green bonds. So how will this uh, framework help us in, in, in uh, measuring impact there in procurement, setting social value impact assessments? Um, as part of decision-making process, we've seen in other places uh, use of well-being impact assessments for cabinet decisions. So as a screening tool in order to uh, think about whether or not the um, uh, decisions are aligned to what's important for living a good life. Staff training, both in terms of the context, so this is what people, what the experience of living in Camden is, but also as a framework for evaluating and assessing work. And then finally, State of the Borough, which we've actually um, already committed to publishing 
uh, alongside this framework, which is a report that will be presented annually as part of our uh, as part of our strategic work in order to uh, take some time to reflect together with the community of partners on how we're doing on our strategic objectives and whether we need to change and adjust. So that's uh, that's kind of high level overview of what we're doing in Camden and uh, the intentions about the, uh, the, the well-being framework or, or Good Life Camden. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? But then a few thoughts in the context of uh, what we're talking about today, which is about the, uh, measuring social outcomes or or implementing social outcomes. Um, and when I was looking across this, I was thinking about, we, we actually have quite a few uh, frameworks out there, right? That like, uh, we don't need to wait till March, 2023, which is our, our launch date to, uh, to think about what this might include. So we've got global frameworks like the SDGs, we've got national frameworks, the UK has developed uh, measures of national well-being dashboard, the OECD has uh, the Better Life uh, Initiative. Um, London, the Greater London Authority is also currently in stages of developing measures for uh, well-being and sustainability and consultation stage. And then there's also um, there's other London boroughs which are working on developing um, well-being measures. So Barking and Dagenham have developed social progress index, but there's there's a multitude of, of examples. So the question is, uh, why develop a local, another local uh, well-being framework? Could we go to the next slide, please? Um, so this is a piece of uh, uh, a graph from a piece of research from the OECD, which compares the OECD framework to other frameworks and, and looks at how they converge across both dimensions and indicators. So the shaded, uh, the shaded squares here basically show uh, or the non-shaded squares are where there's no similarities and the shaded squares are different levels of similarity, whether across dimensions or across indicators. But basically, hopefully this visual gives you quite a powerful sensation of there's a strong overlap in different frameworks. So what you see at the top are uh, a lot of different frameworks from different countries. So um, Australia, Luxembourg, Korea, Italy, you know, uh, New Zealand, a lot of OECD countries up, on, up at the top. And then on the side, there's the different dimensions of uh, well-being. So health, education, jobs and earnings, personal security, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you look along all those, all those dimensions, most frameworks measure most things uh, quite consistently. Um, can we go to the next slide and uh, last slide? Um, so on one hand, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of frameworks out there. On the other hand, um, they do tend to converge. So what are the benefits of divergence and uh, convergence? And these are some of my thoughts, but I'm happy to hear any, any others. So in terms of uh, divergence, which is what we're doing in Camden. So di divergence allows us really to bring uh, community voice to um, uh, into the framework. So to allow the community and to allow partners to really say, this is what matters to us, even though that we might expect that to be similar across different places. It helps us develop a cross-sector ownership. So we want this to not just be our own framework, but something that belongs to the community and to partners. Um, and in order to do that, we need to do, we need to have a a, an open uh, process of co-creation. It helps us look at localized concerns. So all those white boxes where there weren't similarities across uh, the framework in the previous slides are areas, could be areas where there's a specific concern to for a community that isn't necessarily uh, relevant elsewhere. So you could think in Houston, uh, the HS2 project is really um, a, a big concern for local residents. Um, and then credibility and accessibility. So the power of the framework really isn't, uh, the, the framework doesn't have any impact if we don't have a level of credibility uh, in the community and accessibility. People know, recognize it, understand it for what it's for. On the other hand, benefits of convergence. So uh, convergence allows us comparability across place. It allows consistency in approaches. If we look at the measures themselves, they can really diverge and then there'll be a big uh, difficulty in comparing across. Um, and it allows for vertical alignment. So if the, uh, if the ONS is looking at a specific uh, at national measures and then all levels underneath are measuring it in the same consistent way, then it's easy to do uh, to do that breakdown and, and, and have a level of granularity that really lets you um, look across places and across time. And then the hybrid option, which I hope uh, we are uh, in some way uh, doing, which is that intrinsically the frameworks are similar. So if we, um, if we are based on best practices, trying to learn from other people's experience, 
you know, maybe at the end of the day, 80, 90% of the framework is actually quite similar, then we've already achieved a certain level of, of convergence. If we prioritize comparability, then that helps in, in the convergence. And then um, we're, still, we're, we're still maintaining that community voice and sense of ownership and, and, um, and, and accessibility to the framework. And then finally, uh, which this is really my, 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 pet, uh, my, my pet peeve about this, but um, uh, linking up practitioners in different settings. So for me, I think what's most important as someone who's doing this on the ground is to be able to talk to people both horizontally and vertically who are doing the same thing in order to make sure that even though we're developing something that might look visually different, might have a different name, is essentially the same and we can learn from each other and then make sure that we, we can align. So that's, that's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. and I think whatever else you can say about Camden Council, I don't think you can accuse them of shying away from difficult challenges in terms of uh, trying to work out how on earth you develop measures for such a diverse population in terms of well-being and also frankly the question I know you've worked at global levels for the OECD and uh, so on uh, what is the merits of doing something bespoke given all the other uh, work that is going on and no doubt we'll come back to that but absolutely fascinating um Suzanne's already mentioned the role of non-state actors. Michael's already mentioned the concept of constrained discretion. I think both of those concepts and more will feature in the next presentation um, from Connor Sullivan and Martha McGregor of Bridges Fund Management, who are going to take us through improving outcomes uh, in the very uh, tricky and contentious area of asylum. So over to you. Do you need this mic or does it? Yeah, it's on. I believe so. Um, yeah. Hi everyone, thanks very much to the GoLab for inviting us to present. Um, so just quickly by way of introduction, so I'm Connor Sullivan, I'm a director at Bridges Outcomes Partnership. So we are an organisation that supports um, delivery organisations and outcome funders to design, develop, deliver um, social outcomes contracts. Um, I have with me my colleague Martha, who is the programme director for one of the services we're going to talk about today. So um, for today's session, we would like to sort of briefly run through the Refugee Better Outcomes Partnership. So this is, these are two programs supporting uh, refugees that have come through the asylum process um, with their integration to, into the community. Um, in the, sort of the context of the discussion today, what we'd like to focus on is just to quickly give you a brief Kind of introduction to the, the context of the service and the, and, the, and the social issue that it's addressing but then how then how the government went about trying to address that issue so in this in this service with the home office as, as the outcome payer and commissioner um who in the the, the the constrained discretion model that michael spoke about um set a vision and some target outcomes for the service and then allowed local delivery partnerships to form around those outcomes and allow those delivery models to be flexible to address the specific local needs in each of the, the areas that these projects were launched. Um, and I'll hand over to Martha towards the end to um, actually talk about what that looks like in practice on the ground in, in the Northeast. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so just briefly in terms of, you know, what, what is the social issue? What, was, what is the social issue that the, the Home Office was trying to address? So in, in the UK, we have a, a two tier, um, refugee system. Um, so at the, at the top there, you've got the resettlement route. So these are um, government sponsored programs where people are taken, that move directly to, to the UK. Um, they are um, placed immediately in temporary accommodation. And many of those people will eventually be moved into, into social housing. So the, the Syrian and Af Afghan schemes are good, good examples of this. And throughout that process, um, and this would of course varies across the country, but there is support typically provided through local authorities to help the refugees throughout that process, funded by the Home Office. Um, so alongside that, you have the asylum process. So um, an asylum seeker will arrive in the UK, often after a long and traumatic journey that we've, we've all read about. Um, they are then placed in initial accommodation whilst the Home Office decide whether or not to uh, review their application for asylum. Um, they are then 
placed into what's called dispersed accommodation. So that could be accommodation anywhere across the UK where they will live whilst they wait for Home Office to make a decision as to whether or not um, to accept their asylum application. Um, so, so during that period, um, you know, whilst they're in that dispersed accommodation, um, obviously they have their, their housing um, needs uh, addressed and they believe they receive very low level kind of welfare support from the asylum accommodation provider, but they have no access to any other services. Um, things like English language training, for example, that they're not allowed to work. There's very limited opportunity for an asylum seeker during that process to build any kind of social network in, um, of social capital in the UK or any kind of understanding of the system um, you know, outside of the immediate accommodation that, that they're living in. Um, so once, if the Home Office do decide to accept the asylum application and, and the, the refugee receives uh, leave to remain, they then have 28 days to move out of the asylum accommodation. Um, and in the context of you know, the lack of exposure they've had to the system during that stay in asylum, which can take anything up to you know, two years or more, um, that places them at very high risk. And, and at, at that point, they have a variety of needs that they need to support with. So housing being the most immediate and, and obvious area, English language training, support around employment, um, you know, often mental health is a, is a key issue for many of the uh, refugees that we're, we're working with. And although they, you know, at this stage, they do have recourse to public funds, and there are um, you know, government services like the local housing option, local authority housing options teams, the WP job centres, there are services there. Because they don't have the understanding of the system, because in many cases they've got low level of English, that they find it really difficult to access and engage with those services. Um, and there's no coordinated support in place to help them kind of manage to manage that. Um, you know what, what that means in the short term is, is many will end up in homeless, um, in temporary accommodation, or, or worse. Uh, and it's a longer term. Um, you're looking at employment outcomes for this group. They are in materially below the wider population. I think the figure is sort of 22 percent below the wider um, population in terms of numbers in, in employment. Um, and it's it that issue, that kind of issue around the transition out of the asylum process that this programme was set up to address. Um, next slide, please. So, so what did the Home Office do? Uh, so the first step is they, they pulled funding uh, across three different local uh, central government departments through uh, an initiative run by the Treasury, the Shared Outcome Fund. So recognising that the outcomes for this group would touch on different parts of, of government. Uh, so the Home Office led that and they, they created the Refugee Transition Outcomes Fund that pulled that uh, funding from across DWP and, and DCMS. Um, they then set the vision and the target outcomes for the service. Uh, and, they, and they did that in a collaborative process to taking input from um, sector experts, including frontline delivery organisations. And they set the, the core target outcomes of the service so around integration, employment and housing. And obviously there's sort of specific kind of uh, outcomes within, within each of those areas as well. And then, and then they invited local partnerships to form um, around those outcomes and allowed those uh, each area to develop its own um, model, depending on what the need was for that particular region. Um, so next, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, in, in, in terms of the, the two partnerships we're supporting, um, so we've got the, the North East Rise programme that, that Martha um, leads and also a programme uh, in, in Plymouth, both with distinct partnerships of local um, voluntary sector organisations and in the case of North, North East Rise actually a local authority uh, as one of the delivery partners. Um, so what, what, we, what we had going into the service was a, a clearly defined central vision um, set by the Home Office and clear outcomes set by the Home Office. And then we had these partnerships that then had the flexibility um, to uh, adapt and innovate the services uh, in a way that would meet the specific local needs. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Martha to tell you what that looks like in the North East. Thanks, Donna. Yeah. So next slide, please. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm running the Northeast Rise programme for Bridges, and I wanted to give you an idea of how 
the, the benefits of a contract like this. So the outcomes are set at that top central level and they're based around getting refugees um, in, integrated into society, getting them uh, into jobs and sustaining them in those jobs and also getting them into safe and secure accommodation and helping them to maintain tenancies. And um, because those things are set centrally, but it's the outcome that's set rather than the service delivery, we're able to really localize our response to that um, within the Northeast in order to address those challenges. So I'll talk you through the four areas, what some of the big challenges are um, across the country and how we try to find solutions for them. So the biggest sort of challenge that we had to start with was actually reaching refugees, which is something that both local and central government struggle with in terms of getting refugees to access services. The reasons for that is that the data on contact data for refugees is really poor. They move around a lot when they're in the asylum process. They don't have very easy access to mobile phones. Their addresses change and they don't have a network that you can easily track them down with. They have a very understandable fear of agencies. They've had really bad experiences with the Home Office. They've had sometimes quite difficult experiences with the Job Centre, possibly with local government. And so as a Home Office funded contract, we have to be really careful about the way we approach people. And then lastly, they are in a, in a new country with a very limited network and they have to feel that what they're joining has the kind of, is vouched for by the community basically. So we're running a really short program and we had to get the community to vouch for us really quickly, despite it being a brand new project and it's despite it being run by the Home Office, which a lot of them didn't trust. So we've addressed that with a couple of different ways. Um, we signed a data sharing agreement with the asylum provider in the Northeast, which gave us much better contact information. And we then contacted refugees by really carefully using language that distanced us from um, agencies that refugees have a poor association with. So that was using text messages and WhatsApp rather than sending people formal letters. Um, it was about maybe finding <coughs> a caseworker from a similar community to come and meet that person face to face so that they could vouch for the service. But as I said, most importantly, it was about getting the community to back us and back the providers. And we partnered with, like, as part of our partnership, we have a company called The Other Perspective. They're refugee run and they have an amazing network with the local refugee community organisations. So once they vouched for our programme, so did the refugee community organisations. And we were able to really quickly build up trust with that community. And we now have lots of people on the programme who are also referring their friends, their family, etc. It was really important to get that word of mouth right. And that had to happen locally. It couldn't have happened at a central level. On integration, this is obviously a huge topic and there's no sort of, you can't hold, there's no one refugee that's like perfectly integrated into society because it means something that's totally different for everyone. And again, that's why it was really important for us to be able to localise it, not just to the Northeast, but to each specific individual. For some people, um, integration is about having a job in the country. For others, it's about... Um, being in a house that's their own and buying their own house and getting a mortgage. For some people, it might be about making friends. It's, it's very different for each person. Um, the asylum system has an enormous impact, damaging impact on people's confidence. As you can imagine, a lot of these people have been through a very traumatic journey to get here. And then they're spending, I mean, one woman we worked with had spent 17 years in the asylum process. That's 17 years where she's not been able to work and she's not known at any point whether she's going to be sent back home. She was separated from family members, from children. It has a huge impact and it stops you from being able to find a connection with your local community and build up your local knowledge, understanding of what activities and connections you might be able to make out there. And then to Connor's point, when you get your positive decision, it should be this really amazing moment where you've received your positive decision, you've got your right to remain, and you're told in 28 days, you're gonna be kicked out of your accommodation. So you then have 28 days to find out where you're gonna live, find out how you're gonna to afford to live, and you've had, no, um, you've had no time to build up any work history, even kind of volunteering experience. In lots of cases, you still don't really speak any English. So it's a really traumatic time. And we've tried to come up with solutions that are very local. So we work a lot on just supporting people with those immediate needs, getting them signed up to universal credit, getting their housing applications sorted. But it's also about um, building an individualised plan for each refugee, working out what their interests are, what their hobbies are, and then connecting them with an activity locally that will allow them to meet other people and to sort of build on that hobby. So lots of our clients are really interested in gardening and there's loads of community gardens um, around uh, the northeast area and it gives them an opportunity to meet 
other people who were doing similar things, either other refugees or local people. We've set up um, sports clubs. Lots of our refugees are very into football. And so lots of them play football with local teams and have kind of tournaments. Or there might be a couple of our clients who are really interested in film and media, and uh, they're coming together to create a little film about the RISE programme and interview other clients. And that gives them something that's a real kind of their own thing within the Northeast, within their new life in the UK. So onto employment, one of the biggest barriers here is language, as you can imagine, and the current um, method for teaching refugees is often of a really patchy quality. We have an ESOL provision in the UK, and those um, ESOL classes are kind of a bums on seat model. So there's no real emphasis to push people through the system and really improve their English at like a quick rate. A lot of the time they're oversubscribed and uh, the assessments are really patchy and refugees can end up in the wrong courses. So we've tried to address that by really tailoring the uh, language provision to the need of the individual. So that might be one-to-one -one sessions for people who just have really low confidence and need a bit of a boost to be able to get more out of those ESOL classes. Or it might be about making them really specific to the industry that that person wants to go into because really what they need is loads of uh, motorbike part vocabulary because they want to be a motorbike mechanic. So really tailoring it to the need of that person. Um, but also you'll know that a lot of the way people get jobs are by obviously their work history, but also about their network and employers way more likely to want to work with you and sort of see you positively in an interview if you've been recommended by a friend. Refugees don't have that professional network. So we've really tried to build on the networks of the caseworkers, many of whom have lived experience as refugees and who know lots of other refugees who are business owners in the area, as well as through more formal avenues like um, agencies that specifically recruit and um, place refugees in jobs, etc. So then lastly, onto the housing. This is a huge problem across all of our programmes at Bridges at the moment, and we run lots of homelessness programmes. And... Uh, there are lots of people waiting on homelessness lists across the country. It's a really challenging um, area for anyone, for refugees in particular, the application process is unbelievably confusing. They don't understand the UK process. Many, <coughs> many British people don't understand that process and often they're navigating it in a language that they don't understand. There are also a lot of housing, sort of quite pernicious housing myths that have circulated around the refugee community, like, Go to London, they've got loads of free houses there, which is obviously not the case. Um, or if you wait until the 28th day of your asylum accommodation, then you'll have to be given a house because you'll be leaving it last minute. Again, not true, but then leaves those people in a really dangerous situation when they get there. And there's just a lack of available and affordable housing in this country. So we've tried to address this through a number of different ways. And some of it's about system change. At the moment, a lot of the uh, local authority and housing application pro um, applications processes in the northeast don't recognize a BRP card. That's the only form of ID that a refugee has. Or they will ask for three years proof of address. Again, that's really difficult to prove if you're someone that's walked from Ethiopia to the UK over the last two years. So we've managed to make a few positive changes, which sound really small, but make a really big difference to those people applying. So it also just feels much more inclusive when they're going through that process that their unique situation has been accommodated for. Um, and we've managed to build up a lot of really strong um, partnerships with local housing associations who've actually prioritised some of their properties for our refugees, which has meant that a lot of them have been able to get into safe and secure housing um, faster. And I think the important thing to note on the housing is that when we're talking about integration and someone feeling like they're part of a local community, if they're in a temporary accommodation, they don't know when they're going to get moved, they don't know if their kids' uh, school is going to be moved, they're not going to be able to integrate with the local community. So that housing is absolutely fundamental, such an important part of, part of the jigsaw for their integration and for their employment and for feeling like they're part of their local community. So I hope that's given you a bit of an overview of how those centralised um, outcomes really allow you to kind of bespoke the delivery and tackle challenges um, at the local level. Thank you. Thank you both. Incredibly interesting that what you might look at as lo the, the local delivery of the ultimate nationally determined policy <laughs> and um, uh, and working on behalf of, uh, on behalf of people who almost by definition will not trust uh, authority and with a range of other extremely serious barriers like language and housing shortages. So 
Thank you for that much to uh, pick up on. Before we move to the final presentation, just to say after this, we'll move straight to questions. So to avoid those awkward silences where you try and work out who's going to say something, just um, uh, just get ready to ask a question if you if you wish. Um, but our final um, uh, presentation, I think, is something a bit different. Um, looking forward to this, an alternative uh, perspective. Sometimes I think in this debate on local and uh, national and decentralization, you know, there's a tendency to just talk about decentralization as an automatic good. And if that were the case, then centralization would always and everywhere be mad. So why do we keep doing it? And we're not mad. So i um, delighted to welcome Benjamin Clement from the Fraunhofer um, Institute in uh, Leipzig, one of the cities we uh, talked about. And he's going to give us the example of the uh, challenges of decentralization in a subject that I have to say I don't know much about, uh, the Rhenish Lignite Mining District. Yeah, so I didn't know um, <laughs> over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, take the long way. T take the, 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 the long way to the Lignite. Yeah, it's uh, better. I think so. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me, even though I didn't know exactly much about social outcomes and everything. Um, but uh, we were uh, looking at uh, processes of regional structural change in a region in uh, Germany that is called the Rhenish Lignite Mining District. Um, next slide, please. And this is based on a study that we did for the Regional Development Agency. Um, lignite is a form of coal, brown coal, you may have heard it, and in Germany it's uh, very easy to get because you can just scrape it off the ground with a very large uh, uh, equipment, And uh, but this is also one of the dirtiest forms of uh, uh, how you can heat and uh, uh, heat your um, or get any electricity in your home. So uh, the German central government wants to phase out coal until 2038. And uh, in the process of this, because the central government is um, responsible for taking away a source of employment and value added for these regions, um, it was decided in, uh, that, that the central government has to give money to these regions in a very complex process that I will not explain. Um, <laughs> it was a committee for structural change, but it resulted in 2000, that was in 2018, and in 2020, um, uh, Germany made stru structural change as law. It is a kind of investment law for coal regions, uh, which, uh, and structural, structural strengthening law. And this law says until 2038, the central government will give the state, will spend 14 bill, 40 billions for investments in these regions that save and create, create employment or GDP, diversify the economic structure and improve the location quality and meet SDG goals. Some of these goals have to be met. And <clears throat> uh, the state and the regional level they have to identify and select and decide for the new regional development path. I'm a geographer, you will hear this development path word a bit. Um, it's kind of the way that the region should, uh, well, create employment and uh, uh, GDP. And, uh, and the local level in the region that is, um, ah, here, here's the light. And, mm -hmm. here. and the local level, um, this is, uh, is responsible for the ideas and for the agent of change and creating projects. Next slide, please. And uh, where is this Rhenish lignite mining district? It is east, uh, it's west of um, Cologne and Bonn and Dusseldorf and east of uh, the Dutch and Belgian border. As you see, this is North of Westphalia. Westphalia, where um, previously there was um, uh, black coal mining in the rural area, and there is also the lignite mining there in the uh, Rhenish um, area between Aachen and Cologne. And I mean, it's not even a lot of people there, 9,000 employees, uh, but it's very, uh, there's a lot of energy intensive industries. And so uh, also here they should uh, create some new employment. And, uh, and of course, uh, next slide, please. Uh, next. Um, and uh, this area here, um, it is all in one federal state. That's good uh, to be in one jurisdiction, but actually it's kind of messed up that there are 
three different, uh, two different NUTS2 regions, and there are three different um, so-called chambers of commerce, which we heard uh, previously are very important. And because, uh, and they kind of reflect that the economy of this area is kind of spread. Oh, there it is. No, it doesn't work. Um, it's, it's orientating towards Aachen, which is a research center, and it's orientating towards Dusseldorf and Cologne. And in the middle, there are the, um, the large open cast mines. Next slide, please. And it is very important that these, we find some new solution because these are one of the, uh, well, the, this, these power plants, uh, power plants, they emit a lot of CO2. Uh, and uh, it's a lot of employ, it's a lot of GDP there, um, value added, um, it's highly automated. These people earn a lot of money who, cons who work these machines. And it's very difficult to find new development paths, new industries that can um, compensate for these areas. Next slide, please. And we did a study for uh, this regional development agency with a lot of different um, methods I will not uh, look into right now. And we then showed them a bit how should they design, uh, how, how should they just transform their innovation system. And next slide, please. And during that study, we noticed that the Rhenish Lignan Mining District is an example of a very organizationally thick, diversified innovation system. That means it has a very diversified economy besides coal. Um, that means there, is not, there are not any large players in this economy. It's rather SMEs, um, very low tech, very traditional tech. And when the, you have new uh, technology, it's always from coming from the new university, but then it doesn't uh, result into a big global player. And it's organizationally thick, we call it, because it's a very, it's a large thicket of intermediaries, initiatives and associations. There are some redundant institutions because actually nobody in Germany really called this uh, a, a mining district, uh, this area before this whole process of coal phasing out. So the region doesn't feel itself as a region. So it, it, in the region, they think they are three regions. But nevertheless, they have a rich research landscape. Next click, please. <laughs> Which should be perfect for path creation driven by research. But we, we saw that this is not really the case. And now please click three times. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't know I hadn't to click three, three times again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you see a bit uh, the strength I will spare you. Uh, the details, um, but the challenges, uh, we will focus a bit, most of this part, everyone that we interviewed said, we don't know where, who, who is responsible for all of this. There's a lot of bureaucracy, the funding takes too long. I don't know who funds me and when they will fund me. And it's very transparent. And uh, well, people never, thought about the region as this regional identity in a way of having a regional identity and outside of this region also the visibility for this region is not that high. Um, even though the University of Aachen is one of the top technology universities in Germany, but all the uh, graduates from this uh, university go to the south of Germany because there, there are the good jobs. So this region kind of, kind of is in the plank spot for most people. Next slide, please. And uh, I will show some problems in this region uh, that show a bit why decentralization is not always maybe the best solutions, especially in such a case like coal mining. And these are the three reasons. Next slide, please. Um, scattered change agency, we'd like to call it. Um, uh, change agency is very diffused around a lot of actors. Uh, usually that would be a very good thing. And in other coal regions, it's, it's not that way. But in this uh, region, we have so many people that want to do projects and we analyzed what there is. And we, then we noticed they have three hydrogen regions. They have two air taxi initiatives and they didn't talk to each other. What's up here? And uh, everybody, everybody wants to find the, be the solution. Of course, everybody wants to have the funding, of course. 
and that led that led to well a, a so for the well like a immediate program that still is not finished uh, 77 projects are now active 65 are well have the um have the mark uh, you can apply for funding now and 49 others are still in the process so this is a very long funding journey which leads to uh, change agents being only the ones that are very experienced in change in in uh, acquiring funding so these are the universities and some larger players civil organizations but the, the civic society not so much and that means a high degree of coordination in the region is necessary next slide please and that brings us to the question when we decentralize to whom do we decentralize um, because in this area also the regional development agency the mandate that it has or should have is not that clear so all the change agents don't know exactly should they go to the state should they go to the region to who should they implement which kind of depends also on this different uh, orientation in the region which you see here by the computer uh, relationships which are all over the place it's polycentral um, and uh, you have these different sub-regions and you have these different spheres that should take have a role in there and um, even though this is a region with the best transparency is still a low transparency which um, kind of leads to the way that nobody exactly knows who has the plan <coughs> Um, one central plan in the region, and nobody really knows what is the um, what is the strategy going to be, and how this will all fit together. Uh, this is really not only the case in this region, but also in the other ones. Um, and uh, one thing that is maybe also dangerous for the society there is that um, the ones that are most uh, funded in this process are mostly in the research centers near Cologne, Dusseldorf and Aachen, but there are not the um, open cast mines. So you can imagine the people in the open cast mines are now asking, so isn't that about us? But now you're funding quantum technologies <laughs> and neurotech semiconductors. What do I have to do with this? And um, yeah, I should maybe speak into the microphone. I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so uh, to a certain degree, when you decentralize, you should take also a regional central actor. So to centralize something in within the region. And um, in the end, um, for the next slide, we, um, you can see also that even if you have a central actor, um, you have the problem in these great challenges of uh, energy transition, um, which is a very wicked problem. Um, maybe we're thinking too too small with, in some initiatives. I know it's cool to have local initiatives and bottom up is very good and great, but sometimes uh, these these all these initiatives they can cannot come up um, towards all these system level problems. And we noticed that that in the end a lot of people say. Well, we can do something, but it won't change a lot because the whole structure will be in the way at some point. And then Germany is very decentralized. That means uh, every level has some responsibilities. And for example, the communities, one of their main responsibilities is, is uh, childcare, for example. Right. So now these actors should uh, develop some economic and economical plan. And for some of these cities or towns or even smaller villages, this is this is overwhelming. They cannot do this. So you have to support uh, by a central agency, for example, these small actors in also going on a successful funding journey. And what we don't manage in this region and the other ones too, um, you should actually just to prioritize in some fields, but all these regions are very spreading out their options because they don't want to pick winners, which can sometimes be good, but it kind of uh, makes the process take too long. Yeah. And some large scale, large scale solutions should be uh, looked at. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Next slide. Uh, this is only the 
where last con con conclusions, I think you've seen the Rhenish mining district is an example uh, for a region with good, good options, but um, is slowed down by decentralization and especially a large mission like energy transition, it's very difficult to handle for local regional actors. So you need a central government that says, um, says, says something about the strategy, how to get there where you want to go. Uh, thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you, Benjamin. Uh, really good reminder as to why there are uh, tensions and why there are centralizing instincts, differences between national and local incentives and delivering locally on a national priority when locally they can't even agree on how many units of uh, locality there, there are. And I could detect quite a lot of sympathy um, amongst the audience, uh, certainly in the room with some of the things that you said. I'm not gonna try and sum up the five excellent presentations together, just thanks to all the presenters. We don't have as much time for questions as perhaps we would have liked, but let's get going. Yes, please, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, I'll start with the regional disparities ones. Um, this being a social outcome conference, did you gain any insights uh, from you know, the social impact of these transformations? A bit related to the last presentation, you know, I can see myself sipping an espresso in this green image, but you know, the previously employed people there, where did they go? How did they fit in into that image? If you have any insights from that. Uh, and also relating to that, um, did you get, get any insights from how these you know, development issues um, were deliberated and decided within the local governments and regional governments, and indeed we're between the local governments and other local forces, such as civil society actors, for instance? So if you could elaborate on that. I think that's for you, Ian. And if anybody online wants to ask a question, just use the Zoom hands up function. Um, Ian, please. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, uh, the big one uh, in terms of where did the traditional employment go? Lots of them left uh, almost all of these uh, areas. Uh, I looked at the Anglo-Saxon uh, versions and they depopulated uh, quite quite quickly. So, uh, that, but that was a big challenge that they had to then address because they had lots of uh, big assets you know there was a bigger city and they had to keep that going and that's actually you know maintaining the, the public services it's very, it actually impacts on the social outcomes you know is that they need to fund those and so what they're doing is kind of uh, reinventing themselves and uh, restructuring and trying to attack attract people back which places like uh, um pittsburgh uh, have managed to do uh, they're repopulating how they reach decisions um yeah, it depends on the on the different city, but they almost all of them did a lot of engagement with the communities to, to get the communities to articulate a vision, especially uh, true in the, the case of Newcastle, New South Wales. There's a lot of community engagement and it's ongoing you know, for decades. They're, they're speaking a lot to the community and asking them what they want. And, and it turns out that what they want are the kind of things that are good for the fourth industrial revolution. So it's, uh, it's kind of wisdom of crowds, which is uh, very good. Thanks very much, Ian. I don't know if any of the other panelists want to come in. If not, um, Ali, you want to next? Thank you. Thanks for all of the presentations. Of course, we're on the back of a keynote about power, and Julie Batalana, I think, gave us some great provocations about how power being sticky and maybe the need to agitate, innovate, or orchestrate in order to move power around. So I was particularly interested in reflections either from Camden or from, you know, Home office is sort of this almighty godlike figure in all of your diagrams. What, do you have reflections on the back of the power discussion for what that means for the art of project? Um, come to Michal first and then perhaps uh, Connor or Martha. Well, I work in Camden, um, but I <laughs> um, but I actually think that Camden is really, really invested in trying to dissipate power and to get the community involved. Um, that's why we, we talk about a, a, a co-creation, working with the community, and that's where this project really starts from. So it's about, you know, not un recognizing, being humble as public servants um, and recognizing that we don't know best and that we need to talk, we need to understand uh, from the community. And there's a lot of uh, various initiatives that um, are in Camden that, that, that try to speak to that. I mean, the, the power still lie, you know, at the end of the day, the local authority is responsible for and delivers a lot of the public uh, in, in interventions, um, but trying to get uh, the community involved in that is really part of it. I think an interesting, an interesting element of that is when there isn't the demand for it. So people don't necessarily want to 
um, or have the capacity to, or you know, what do we need to do in order to, to really enable them? Martha O'Connor, the spectre of the Home Office, any, <laughs> any thoughts? They are pretty powerful. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think they're powerful. That's why the refugees we work with are scared of them, um, to be really candid. But the, the Home Office would class, as would uh, the local authorities that we work with, would class like huge numbers of the people in that community as hard to reach and that they're never able to access them. And some of the organisations that deliver Northeast Rise have hundreds and hundreds of those people together every week and see them all the time. So I do think there is massive power in community and those people that are hard to reach are being reached by someone, even if it's not the Home Office. So at a big systematic level, I don't think you could pretend that they aren't very powerful, but I do think there is, I've been really amazed at the power of the community organisations that are working on this project. Question right at the back. Thanks very much. I, I want to probe a bit more on this because what I took away from um, Ian and Suzanne's presentation, possibly also from Benjamin's, was that the, the regional development efforts have depended um, on stable long term funding and presumably a political commitment and support coordination from the central government. So I, I wonder whether it would be fair, sometimes anchored in multilateral relations, I think you mentioned the EU um, as well. So I wonder whether it would be fair to suggest that it's the absence of this support that explains why we're having this conversation about levelling up um, in the UK right now. Um, and if so, um, what might be done about it? Suzanne, I don't know if you want to come in or if you heard it or perhaps. Oh, I don't think we hear, I don't think we can hear you, I'm afraid, Suzanne, this time. So. Um, Perhaps uh, in your thing. Yeah, I, I could give a, a very quick uh, response on that one. Uh, sorry, 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 Suzanne, unless uh, you get on me to know. Um, yeah, I think the, the intermediate level of governance uh, is the one that really is the key in the, in the case studies we looked at, because they're the ones that coordinate that, that the management of the resources and empower the local level. Um, so, for instance, in uh, in but, but yeah, but you, you need very strong agency at the, the city level as well, which our case studies have, uh, have had. So Windsor, Ontario, for instance, has had very stable, strong mayoral leadership and a uh, very strong community, as did Newcastle. And uh, Pittsburgh had very strong elites with a really strong uh, bottom-up development of, of community power. But the, without that intermediate level of government to kind of pass those powers down to the the city level, uh, the, the, the initiatives within the, the work. I'm looking at the clock and I know you've got a long day. So I know there's a question here and a question here. I thought I might take them together and see if they align. If not, package them out, but why don't you go first? And it's sort of kind of related to the two previous questions. And um, I, I feel that every de development project or narrative has winners and losers. And so I was wondering, and this is a question to Suzanne and Yen about you know, whether you had a chance to look at some of the winners and losers in the international case studies, because we are talking about spatial inequality as part of leveling up project. And, you know, it's not restricted uh, based on the geography, but within a particular geography, there are inequities between different groups. And so it is important to look at some of these aspects as well. Okay, so the question on the losers within each place, um, hold that thought for a second, we'll take your question. Uh, more of a process question okay. for Camden. So um, on the one hand, you have that bottom up approach in terms of uh, what do local residents understand and, and want when it comes to measuring wellbeing. On the other hand, you have more of a top down in terms of uh, comparability drivers and a, and a list of qualities that potentially limit what indicators are available to you. When I think about that, I think about almost like the channel tunnel. You have two teams digging from different directions and the challenge is to meet in the middle. So my question is, how do you make sure those two teams are digging in sync? And how do you make sure that they meet in the middle? Let's take that one first. Sorry, Karen. Um, we've got a couple of questions online. Okay. Uh, I know we're almost out of time, but one in, one in particular, I think, uh, just to, to thread in, which is probably relates to the first, uh, first presentation, actually, which is, do you have a sort of, ideal role for central government you know we've heard quite a lot about the different roles central government could play so what role should it play right big one. We're, we're going to go to rapid fire and i'll do this so <laughs> michael ideal role of central felix ideal role of central government first 
That's a very easy question. You know, if you're a role of central government. I think the challenge that, that I think is coming across all of these um, these uh, presentations is how do you, um, why well, I think it's a particular challenge here in the UK, is how do you create some kind of relationship between central and local government which allows for enough accountability to the centre while allowing flexibility to the local level. And I think this is an extremely, kind of we, we've seen many examples of in different policy areas of how this is um, kind of can be achieved or not. Um, I'm not sure how the German example really fits within the English example, because I think there are fundamental structural, structural differences. And I think policy areas are very diverse as well. And I'm not so sure whether we can compare these things. But I think in a nutshell, I think it's this question of creating a level playing field at the level that is broad enough to allow for the flexibility at the, at the local level. Okay, thank you. And we have getting the two ends of the tunnel to meet productively and hopefully yeah. in the same place. A uh, great question. Definitely a challenge for us. I think the what we're what we're hoping is that when if we share the objectives of what we're trying to develop, then we will be able to meet in that in that way. So if if, if we have the sort of a, if it's really a true co-creation where we both agree on the objectives, we'll be able to get that. So comparability should be something that residents want to see. You know, are we better than uh, Islington or or Australia? <laughs> Um, Suzanne, again, I don't know if, you've, uh, if your microphone's now working, but if you might want to try, um, lastly, the winners and losers within the same place. You know, how do you manage that? What does the research and experience show? Yeah. Can, can you hear me you? now? Okay, great. No, I, um, I think that's actually a great question. And one of the things um, that we also highlighted in our case studies is that I mean, all of the cases we looked at are deemed successful in the sense that they managed to, to turn around, create new jobs, new employment. But what we have also seen is that there's still quite a significant level of unemployment in a lot of these places. So often it tends to be still higher than the average unemployment within the country. So, yes, <laughs> the, you will, even in those places where leveling up has happened and that have been successful to turn around, you will have a group within the society that unfortunately has doesn't benefit the same way and this is then where different safety nets um, come in that need to be in place so focusing exclusively on the kind of economic development side and skills training etc is important but you do need to to keep in mind also the other social aspects because there will be groups that won't be able to benefit um, and i think i'll leave it here um, if there was a bit high level but i don't think we have more time well, thank you. And we are out of time, but I know that in Benjamin's presentation, you know, a readily identifiable group of at-risk people and potentially likely losers came across very strongly yeah. in yours. So just to say very quickly, thanks to all the um, uh, presenters, fascinating exchange of central, local, non-state, uh, huge range of policy issues. So thank you very much. Thank you to everybody who gave up the time uh, to come. Thank you to all of you online to whom we sadly now say goodbye. For those of you here, uh, there are now drinks in the Inamori Forum, which uh, very helpfully is just there. Uh, <laughs> so not difficult to find. And of course, dinner later. Um, thank you very much and good evening. <laughs>